Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our FCS Express 7 um, FCCF virtual classroom. Uh, I am not Sean Burke, as you can tell by my voice. Uh, this is Kathy Daniels. I'm the manager of the uh, Full Cytometry Core facility here uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, and we welcome everyone who's joining us today um, from across facilities uh, who's looking to uh, learn a little bit more about FCS Express 7. Um, so we're welcoming Sean today um, to, to do this seminar for us. And we just wanted to go over a couple of slides before we um, transferred over to, to his presentation. So for today, um, we're gonna be going over a couple of different things from importing samples and gating populations, the statistics and, and more. I think someone just potentially mute. Okay, so then from there, we're going to be going to discuss some important ones. Um, everyone hear me okay? Sean, can you give me a thumbs up? It's okay? Oh, it's bad, okay. <laughs> there's, a there's a little bit of background going on there. I think somebody's probably um, unmuted. Okay, what's that? Let me just check. All right, I think I found them, turned them off. Okay. All right, should be good. Okay, great, sounds a little bit better now. Um, thank you, Sean. So some important links that we just, um, I wanna mention to everyone um, is first off, DeNovo software. So if you don't have FCS Express um, and you're outside of the core facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering, please visit denovosoftware.com. And we're very thankful for them to uh, work with us today for this virtual classroom. Our website uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is fccf.mskcc.org. Then there's also our Twitter at FlowMSKCC where we have a lot of content available um, for, our, um, for our users, for the Flow community at wide. And we're doing um, quite a few announcements for educational um, opportunities during this time and even beyond this time. ISAC is available um, and during um, the current situation, what they're allowing uh, is for free access to Saito University, which is a really great initiative. So we thank ISAC for that. And in order to um, get access to all of that educational material, you can go to ISAC's website and look at CITOU. If anyone does not have any access to FCS files, but are still looking to, um, to do some analysis just to get uh, practice, you can look at flowrepository.org. It's a really nice, um, avenue to be able to download FCS files and, and get a handle for it if you don't have any of your own. Okay, three more links. Uh, we have the uh, Cytometry Part A journal, uh, which is linked here for this Wiley link. There's the MetroFlow, local New York, New Jersey um, flow cytometry users group that we have uh, two meetings every year and post um, some content as well. So feel free to take a look at that website. And last is a, a little reference um, to the how we created that FCS file up top to do our intro to FCS Express and turn it into an FCS file. Okay. Lastly, uh, we have contacts here. So Sean Burke, who's giving a presentation today, this is his email if you need to reach out to him, as well as Ruby Gardner, who is the head of the facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and myself. Um, and that is Daniel K1, not Daniel KI at mskcc.org. Um, Rui and I will both be monitoring the chat function as we go throughout this uh, virtual classroom. So please feel free if you do have questions to type them into the chat box and we will be monitoring that as we go along and either answering ourselves or um, asking Sean to address those questions. So with that, I wanna say thank you to everyone. We hope everyone's staying safe and learning a lot of flow and I'm going to pass it along to Sean. Okay. All right, hi everybody. Hope everybody's doing okay here today. Uh, let's see, can you see my screen coming through here? Yep. All right, great. Yeah, so thanks again, Rui and Kathy, uh, and for everybody uh, joining us here today. Uh, you see I'm trying to move some of my uh, videos of everybody here off of my screen. All right. Um, yeah, so again, what we're going to be covering today are uh, essentially some of the basics in FCS Express. Um, as Kathy mentioned, you know, how to 
uh, bring data files into the software, how to generate some reports, some statistics, um, really how to use the tools in the software to get you up and running. Um, and hopefully we'll be following up with a, a few additional calls, uh, doing some more advanced functionality in the software, higher dimensional analysis, spectral mixing, you know, you name it. Um, and again, as we go through the presentation today, as Kathy mentioned, make sure you ask questions. Um, I'm here to answer questions for you today. Uh, so even if you, you wanna interrupt, uh, we can stop, we can go over uh, something that we're going through in the software. So uh, I do want to give folks a, a little bit of a, a higher level overview of FCS Express before we jump into the training uh, topics for data analysis basics. Um, essentially the agenda today is we're going to be uh, going over an antibody titration. Um, just in the guise, uh, an antibody titration um, to go over some things like importing data, how to work with single color um, samples, how to work with multiple samples at the same time, how to use things like spreadsheets and statistics. And then we'll move on and take a look at um, some more complex analysis. Uh, we'll look at a, a three color immunophenotyping. I try to keep these examples uh, more simple just so we don't get lost in 30 colors of analysis while we're doing something. But but whatever we do for three colors, you can simply expand that out. It scales up very easily uh, for you know upwards of 20, 30 parameters. Not that everybody's doing that, but I think three is a good place to start for uh, something like today. So before we kind of start into uh, the nitty gritty of data analysis, um, I do wanna give you just a quick overview of FCS Express. I know there's some people um, in the room, there's some very familiar uh, names and faces popping up, but I do know there's some people that haven't used the software before. So, you know, why would you wanna use FCS Express? And I always kind of like to start with this slide. It's, it's a little light, it's a little funny, um, but in the past, you know, we used to use this, um, this little Nokia phone, right? Uh, I don't I don't know who here has had that. Um, it was actually my first phone that I got when I was 16, so I'll date myself a little bit. But it did one thing, right? It made phone calls. Um, it actually did two things. You could play a game of snake on it, right? Or maybe three, you could send a $1 text message. But realistically, all of these things that you had in the past, you know, GPSs, cameras, calculators, uh, even a computer, it's all wrapped into a smartphone now. That makes your life super, super easy. And the state of flow cytometry data analysis is in a similar kind of way right now. Um, you know, you have other data analysis software packages, you know, uh, competitors of us or, you know, even you're using Diva or things from the time of acquisition. And then you have to take that data and you have to take it out to another tool like Excel and take it out to another tool like PowerPoint or Photoshop to generate kind of um, statistics and publication quality graphics. And then if you want to do further statistics, you got to bring it into things like GraphPad, Prism, uh, use tools like ModFit. Um, but all of this is now wrapped into FCS Express, which makes life really, really easy. Um, and what you're going to see today, imagine moving a gate in your flow cytometry software and everything in Prism and everything in Excel updates, right? That means your bar plots, your graphs, and that means you're not having to copy and paste and move between software packages all the time. So again, that's kind of where we're at um, with, you know, why people want to use FCS Express. Uh, but FCS Express, it's been around for a long time. We're, we're going on over 20 years now. Uh, we're on version 7, so I know everybody at uh, Sloan Kettering has access to version 7. I know a lot of folks that are uh, calling in from other locations and core facilities probably have access as well. Uh, do keep in mind that we put out an update just this week. Um, you're going to get an email probably on Monday about this, uh, that there's a brand new update to the software available. So I do encourage you to go check that out, especially if you're doing any sort of spectral cytometry. Uh, because this new version is going to handle spectral and mixing for you. Um, but also of note, uh, the company is based in Pasadena, California. Um, myself, I'm one of these little yellow triangles here on the East Coast. I'm in New Jersey, not, not too far from Rui and Kathy. Um, but what I wanted to kind of point out here is that we have folks all over the world to kind of help you out. Um, we have a gentleman who's living in Milan, Italy. We have somebody working out of uh, India, somebody working out of Australia. Um, so, you know, if you write us at two in the morning, um, as you can imagine, my colleague in Milan, Italy is not doing very much right now. He'll be happy to get back to you uh, really at any time of day. Um, but, you know, as the sun comes up around the world, there's gonna be somebody getting back to you with help about um, FCS Express. Now, before we jump into the software, keep in mind it's gonna run on Mac and PC. 
uh, you can use your license uh, interchangeably. You can run it on a Mac, you can run it on a PC, you can run it on both, you can move between these things. Um, you can run data from any cytometer that's on the market. There's no limit to the number of parameters. Uh, we do you know, support complete compensation for really any sort of you know, post-acquisition or acquisition-derived compensation. And we have every sort of you know, standard set of descriptive statistics and all the commonly used plot types uh, that you've been using. Now, if you've been coming from another software, uh, just keep in mind there might be some translations. You know, if you've been working with Flojo in the past and you love that they have zebra plots and you don't see a button in FCS Express for zebra plots, don't assume it's not there. We just call it something else. Uh, we call it a density plot or a contour plot with black and white stripes, right? So maybe not as cool of a name as zebra plot, uh, but that visualization is there and you can use it. And again, if you have questions about how to add access these things, contact our support line and we're really going to help you out. So I'm going to kind of skip over these little examples here, but I think what you're going to see today as we begin analyzing data is that the analysis is always integrated with your final result when we're working in FCS Express. So when we do the antibody titration, the end goal of an antibody titration is to figure out the amount of antibody to use or to generate some sort of titration curve. Um, and you use that to guide you back in the lab about how much antibody to use. So until you have the antibody titration curve, you really don't have a final result. And in other software, you really have to kind of copy and paste data out to Excel and to Prism to arrive at these sort of results. And again, what you're going to see, all of this is integrated in the software um, through these integrated spreadsheets I'm going to show you about today. As you move gates, everything updates in real time. And this is really going to reduce time and complexity uh, for what people are doing in the lab. So again, we're going to kind of keep it, you know, within uh, probably get through all this within the next uh, half an hour, 45 minutes um, is kind of a, a basic overview. Again, the first thing we're going to be doing today is looking at an antibody titration. Um, and again, in this data set, I want you to keep in mind, we're going to show you how to load data. We're going to show you how to compare multiple data files in the same FCS Express layout, how to create some gates, how to create some statistics, and how to create some charts. So I'm going to jump over to FCS Express. And when you launch up FCS Express, the first thing that you're going to see is this startup screen. Um, so if you've never used FCS Express before, this is what you'll see. You click on new layout, and that's going to open up essentially this, which is what we call a layout in FCS Express. Uh, think of it a little bit like a PowerPoint presentation, right? You have a blank piece of paper. It's almost like a slide. Anything that you put on that slide is you know, part of your analysis. Even if you have things that fall off to the side of the slide. If you do that in PowerPoint, it doesn't mean um, that they're not important to you. It just means that when you print something out or you give a presentation, they're not going to be accessible to everybody. So put things you want printed on the page, things that you, you know, might be uh, extraneous to some sort of report. You can put them off to the page. But again, everything in FCS Express is designed to look and feel and work just like Microsoft PowerPoint, just like Microsoft Office. So, you know, when you're using other software, I know you have to kind of think, you know, all right, well, I'm using Diva, so I have to go look through the Diva manual to figure out how to use it. When you're using FCS Express, think about what you would do in PowerPoint to do something. Right? So in PowerPoint, if you wanted to insert a text box, you would click on the insert tab, insert a text box, you'd put some sort of information in that text box, you'd move it, you'd resize it, you know, you'd duplicate it, whatever it is that you kind of need to do with that text box. Uh, additionally, if you wanted to put in shapes or pictures, you know, you can do that in FCS Express as well. Uh, we see a lot of people putting in logos for the companies or the universities that they work at. Um, if you're bored with everything that's going on, you know, you can put in pictures of your kids or kittens, um, spice up your flow cytometry analysis that way. But when it comes to inserting data, and again, we want to get some data in here from an antibody titration, one place to start is to insert a plot type, right? So I've got a density plot here. So just like PowerPoint, if I was inserting an image, I would draw a little box around where I want to insert that plot. FCS Express is going to prompt me to go get some data. And I'm going to go over here to my titration data set. 
And you can see that I've got six different data files. Uh, these were stained with CD3 and increasing concentration. So this is 0.3 microliters, 1.25, 2.5, and upwards from there. But I'm going to choose the first one. I'm going to click Open File. Now that file is going to be inserted in my layout. I can move this plot around, I can resize it. This is my flow data. If I click on the axis, I can change between the different uh, parameters that are here. I'm gonna kind of come back to that in just a minute. But you might be wondering, all right, well, where's the rest of my data, right? So generally, once you have data inserted, um, you wanna go into the data tab and you wanna open up what's called the data list. And the data list is where you kind of manage the data files that you want to be working in FCS Express that day. And now what we do in FCS Express is when you insert a data file for one um, data file, we assume that the other data files that were in that folder are part of the experiment and we automatically pull them into the data list. And that makes them accessible. If I wanted to drag and drop this plot, onto the layout or this data file and insert a new plot for my 1.25 microliter sample, I can do so. Um, the other thing we can do in the data list is instead of having a ton of open plots all over the place, I can select one plot and I can say, change the data on that plot by clicking on this little number to the new data file, right? So instead of, again, having a bunch of different plots open all over the place, you can use these little iteration numbers, you can use these little next and previous buttons that kind of skip between data files to navigate between all of your data. Now, if there's things in here you don't want, you can grab it, you can press the big red X button that will remove them from the data list. You know, maybe you have different uh, experiments in the same folder. If you need to add some things back in there, you can click on this little add button, go in, find the data that you want to add back, add it back into the data list, and then you're kind of off and running again. And the other thing that works in the data list is if you have a, um, if you have a window open, and we'll show this again in just a little bit, like a, a navigator window from Microsoft Explorer, um, you can actually just grab data from here, drag it into the data list. Uh, it's going to tell me that that data file is already here now, um, but that's another kind of quick way to import some data into FCS Express to start analyzing things. So once you have one plot in here, you're kind of on your way to doing some analysis. And generally, the next thing you want to do when you're working with any sort of flow cytometry data is set some gates. You want to start looking at the phenotypes of interest, the subsets that are in here, removing things that are not cells like debris, artifacts, and things like that. So as you can imagine, you know, in, in PowerPoint, if you wanted to do some different things in PowerPoint, you'd probably go up into the tabs at the top. And sure enough, we have a tab for gating. And this is where you can define any of your gates. So I'm going to insert a polygon gate. And what that's going to allow me do, to do is just create a few different points on here. I can connect the last two points. On my other screen, a little window popped up and it said, what do I want to call this gate? You know, do I want to give it some sort of different gate color if I want to? And I click OK, and that gate gets created. Now, you can see here that we have a statistic. It's the percent of gated events. And what you're going to see is that that statistic, as we update a gate, is going to update for you in real time. Um, you're going to see this throughout the software. So if you see things kind of moving around, uh, you're wondering, oh, why are those gated populations changing? It's because in FCS Express, we link the gates up dynamically. So when you move a gate, everything in the software updates. Statistics, gated populations, bar charts, uh, regression curves, all that kind of good stuff. Now, when you have a gate created in the software, probably the next thing you want to do is figure out how these gates are created in a hierarchy. Um, so there's two ways of doing this. In FCS Express, in the Insert tab, there's an object here called the Gate View. And I'll insert this down here so you can see it. And you can see that this is like an object, like a printable object like you'd have in PowerPoint. You can move it, you can resize it, you can put it anywhere that you want. And that's going to be part of your report. Um, it's also going to keep track of all the gates and the gating hierarchies that we're going to create in just a moment. But there's another place that you can manage gates, and it's in the View tab, and it's called the Gate Navigator. 
Now, the reason that we have two places to manage gates is because you might not want to always print out a gating hierarchy on the page. You know, maybe you ran out of room on the page. Maybe that page is devoted for looking at a, a B cell subset and looking at the gate hierarchy doesn't make sense in that part of the report. Well, the gate navigator is not a printable object. It just floats around. It's going to show you your gating hierarchy. You can even dock these things. So if I wanted to put the gate navigator uh, docked over here to where the data list is, then I have this kind of nice little window that I can move around. So if I want to change plots, if I want to look at my gates, I can do that. But when we create some new gates and when we create new plots to create new gates on, both of these things are going to update in concert. Um, so I'm going to show you that in just a second here. Now, one way that I can open up a new plot and create, have a gate applied to that plot is simply dragging and dropping a gate from one plot out into a blank space in this layout. So if I drag that cells gate out and I drop it, you can see that a new plot gets opened up. Um, we're only looking at the events that are within that cells gate. And as I update that, that plot on the right is updating immediately in real time because the gate is applied. So what I can do is I can simply change to another parameter, like my CD3 Fitzy parameter. If I want to create another gate in here, I can come in and create some additional gates. We'll do something kind of simple here, and we'll call this CD3 positive. And I'll create one more gate over here. And we're going to call this CD3 negative. Okay. Just pulling this over from my other screen. And you can see that we have these two gates created. Now, what you'll notice is that in the gate view and in the gate navigator, those gates were created. Uh, we know that because we put the gating, um, the cells gate onto that plot to create these gates hierarchically. But if you want to change the hierarchy or change the order of these at any time, you can simply drag and drop. And you can see that if I drag the CD3 negative gate on top of the CD3 positive gate, uh, obviously that gating position doesn't make any sense, um, but it will create them hierarchically. And it will do that in the gate navigator. If I change this over here in the gate navigator, it will change that over in the gate view. Uh, again, these are completely interchangeable and you can use them, you know, both the same way at any time. So, you know, keep that in mind, this gate view, I'm going to kind of put it over here to the side, um, but the gate view, gate navigator, they work the same way. One is a printable object, one is not. Now, additionally, there's one little tip I like to show folks about gating. Um, so one thing that can happen is if you're not happy with a, a polygon gate and it's kind of like a top level gate in your hierarchy, I know in other software, if you needed to replace that gate, if you just wanted to change the shape, essentially you have to recreate a lot of your gating hierarchy. Um, in FCS Express, if you want to do that, you can just draw a new gate on the plot. I'll draw a freeform gate here. And what you can do is when the gate view, uh, create a new gate dialog pops up, you can say replace a gate. So if I want to replace that cells gate with this new freeform gate, I can click OK. And now we're using that gate. Our gating hierarchy gets maintained. Any of our downstream statistics get maintained. Any of our plots that are downstream uh, get updated immediately. So just kind of keep that in mind. I know it's like a little thing, but I know a lot of people have trouble in other software packages um, when doing things like that. Now again, this is an antibody titration, and in this antibody titration, we have six different data files. And really what we want to do in, in this kind of basic workflow is get these six data files on the same page so we can look at them side by side. Now, that workflow is not appropriate for all data analysis. You know, if you're doing a very complex immunophenotyping, you're not going to want to have, you know, 100 plots for six different data files on the same page. You're just going to be, you know, making your plots really small or creating lots and lots of extraneous pages for your analysis. But in this particular workflow, again, if you just want to have some data, um, you know, six, seven, 10, maybe 15 files on the same page in a layout, you can do this. Now, before I run what we call a duplicate and next to get all of this data file onto the page, you probably want to get things kind of organized. So if I was in PowerPoint and I had two objects that weren't really lined up too well to each other, well, what I could do is I could multiple select the objects. I could come over to the Home tab and I can align the tops. And again, same thing. You can do that in FCS Express. 
And I want to show you a kind of cool trick. Um, it's a trick for PowerPoint as well as FCS Express. I actually learned a lot of things about Microsoft Office when using FCS Express. But if you have two objects in the software and you want to resize them to be the same size, and as a grad student, I usually ran into this trying to put together um, you know, presentations for lab meetings and things like that where I wanted to just have two images the same size. Well, what you can do is if you grab the image or the object, the first object, then you hold down control and you multiple select the second one. If you come into the align functionality, you can go into this position objects and say, make them the same height and the same width. And what that will do is it will make both plots the same size as the original plot that you clicked on. So again, that's something that works in PowerPoint, right? So take this back to whenever you do your lab presentations, you know, a lot of what you learned in FCS Express can even be kind of ported back uh, to working with Microsoft Office. But I've got these about the right size. I'm going to make them just a little bit kind of bigger that way so I can look at them. And if I want to get all of these data files quickly and easily onto this page, instead of having to drag and drop and drag and drop and then, you know, create gates and multiple plots and things like that, or double click on these things and have plots open all over the place, I can just get the first plots organized. And then I can go over here to my home tab and use this button for multiple duplicate and next. Now what this will do is it will duplicate the first plot. It will put it somewhere and we're going to tell FCS Express to put uh, the duplicated plot below the original. We're going to say put it just below and it's going to do that for as many data files as you have in the data list. So again, keep an eye on this here. It's going to happen very quickly. So when I click OK, what's going to happen is FCS Express is going to duplicate the first plot. It's going to uh, create a new plot for the second data file, a new one for the third, and do that for all of the data lists down the page. And if you ran out of page size here, it's going to start a new page for you. Or if you wanted to, you could kind of do an undo and then redo that to get things to fit on the page. All right, so just like that, we've created this, you know, antibody titration report really pretty easily. Um, and we have everything on this page. But as I start looking around these different data files, what I'm starting to notice is that, all right, well, this CD3 positive gate is probably not appropriate for this 20 microliter sample, um, even though it's appropriate for this 0.3 microliter sample. And the reason that's happening, in this case, there's actually a biological uh, reason for our gates needing to be moved around, is because as I'm adding more CD3 antibody to these things, uh, the cells are becoming brighter and the autofluorescence is also increasing because I'm adding more and more antibody. So this is a great use case for using different gating positions for the same gate between different data files within the same experiment. Right? Uh, a lot of times you want to use the same gating positions for everything and kind of lock it down, but we know that sometimes there's cases like this where you need to change that. Now in FCS Express, when we create a gate, the gating position is a global gating position. So if I move this cells gate, you're going to see that across all of the samples that I have here, that cells gate moves together in the same position. Um, the same thing would happen here. If I move my C3 gate for, say, my 10 microliter sample, all of those gates for the downstream samples move at the same time. So what we can do is make use of a functionality in the software called data-specific gates to make these gates specific or their position specific for a particular data file. So if I click on a gate and I go into the gating tab and I say make it a data-specific gate, this particular gate will now move on its own. It's only specific for that data file, whereas the rest of the gates are still in that global gating position. But we know it would be kind of a pain if you had to go through and click on the gate and go up to the gating tab and do that over and over again. Um, so there's a little shortcut key. If you select a gate, hold the shift button, which I'm doing right now, and move that gate, it will become data file specific. Right? So again, if you need to kind of quickly go through and change some gating positions, you can hold down the shift key, kind of get your gates into whatever position that you need for that particular data set or experiment, um, and those gates will become data file specific.
right? So again, very useful functionality for that. And if you're used to working with Flojo, the way that Flojo operates is essentially gates are data file specific when you create a gate, and then you have to take that gate, drag it up to the top of the workspace, apply it to everything to make it global. Um, when you're working with FCS Express, essentially we work in the inverse. Everything's a global gate position until you make it data file specific. But we know a lot of people are starting to come over from Flojo and using FCS Express. If you really love the way that they do that, there's um, one of our user options. You can actually inverse that preference so you can do it uh, more of the way that you've been used to doing it in the past. So again, we pretty much have everything we need here for an antibody titration. Um, we have all of our gates in the correct positions. We have all of our samples in here, but it would be really helpful if we created some statistics. So we didn't just have to look at these plots and kind of eyeball where the maximum amount of antibody staining is, right? Now, if you're using other software, you're probably creating tables and copy and pasting those tables out to Excel and then creating graphs in Excel or creating graphs in Prism. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people aren't doing proper antibody titrations. Even though it'd save them a lot of money and a lot of antibody down the line, we know that that's kind of a pain in the butt with other software. But what we can do in FCS Express is we can use these tools for integrated spreadsheets. Again, these are in the Insert tab. It's in the Spreadsheets little button here. And if we click on Spreadsheet, you're going to be prompted to insert a spreadsheet. And lo and behold, it's kind of like Microsoft Excel starts appearing in FCS Express. And again, if you know how to use Excel, you know how to use these spreadsheets. If you enter some numbers, you type in a formula, you know, one cell divided by another, it will create a formula reference. If you change a value that's in there, that formula reference will update. Now, again, it works like Excel. If I click on the spreadsheet, there's an entire layout navigator for the spreadsheets, you know, doing things like putting uh, borders, aligning fonts, merging cells, uh, sorting, sorting cells. This is actually really useful. Say you're doing a GFP uh, screen in a 96 well plate. We could get all the MFIs in here and sort on the highest expressor, right? So all those kind of things are in here. Um, we also have every formula or almost every formula that Excel has. So, you know, when you see later on, we do things like standard deviations, p-values. That's how we're gathering that information the same kind of formulas as you would use in Excel. Um, tax season is here. If you want to try doing your taxes in the software, you know, you can probably get it done. Um, but just as an example, if I do an average of these two cells, right, it works just like Microsoft Excel. But we do understand, we don't want you typing in here. We don't want you having the copying and paste, right? That's going to be a major pain. So instead of doing that, if I wanted to say, all right, well, let's grab my CD3 uh, gate and drag it in here. Well, when I drag a gate in, FCS Express is going to say, well, what information do you want from that gate? And if I put in number of events, it will show me the number of events. And if I say, all right, well, I've got a statistic here. Let's drag it and drop it into the spreadsheet. It's a percentage, it goes into the spreadsheet. And if I wanted to do some sort of calculation like that, I can do it. But because I drag and drop this from a plot and from a gate, as I move that gate, the values in the spreadsheet will update, whether it be in the original cell, in the calculated cell, all of that information is updating dynamically. And this is, again, how we're going to later create bar plots and pie charts, uh, regression analysis that all links back to your data. But again, if I had the drag and drop from every single gate and every single statistic, well, I'd still be dragging, you know, 15 or 20 things in here, and that would be a major pain. But there's another place where we have data, and that's in our data list. So if I open up this data list again, and I want to get information for these six data files into that spreadsheet, you can probably imagine what I'm going to say. I'm going to say multiple select them and drag and drop it into the spreadsheet. So when we do it, um, it, FCS Express is going to prompt me if I want to put in some sort of statistic or even metadata from the data file. Um, I'm going to just choose a statistic in this case. But FCS Express is going to prompt me, what do you want? And I'm going to say from the CD3 parameter for the CD3 negative gate, give me two things. Give me the file name because we want to know which row is associated with which file. And then let's put in the median. Let's put in the MFI, right? So I do that. And then for all six of my data files, I'm going to have the file names. I'm going to have the median of the CD3 negative population. 
Um, I can auto size my columns. And again, what will happen is as I move that gate, all of the values in the spreadsheet will update. And you might be looking at the values down here and wondering, all right, well, why aren't those updating? Because if you remember, we made those data file specific gates. So they're only going to update if you move that particular gate because it's associated with that data file. And again, this is really how we can build up, you know, a lot of kind of complex statistics and reports into the software. Um, so again, if I wanted to put in another statistic for my antibody titration, like the CD3 positive, let's put in the MFI just for that. And you can see here that the MFI for the positives are going to come in here, but it looks like they kind of went into the wrong place, right? And I did that on purpose just to show you that just like Excel, if you need to grab a group of data and move it around, um, you can move that data around. If you want to change the column header, right, you can do that. And then if we wanted to create some sort of ratio to compare the MFI of the positives to the negatives, I can say, all right, well, let's create a formula, positives divided by negatives. And then just like Excel, I'll drag that formula down to apply it to everything. And now I have some sort of information um, about all of my CD3 positivity and negativity. And if you wanted to put in a stain index formula in there, of course you could put in a stain index formula. This is just a really basic ratio to show you how this works. Now, the other thing I'm probably going to need is a concentration. Um, unfortunately, with this data set, the concentration was not stored as a keyword. Um, that's why I always recommend people to annotate their data as much as possible, because if you have it in there, FCS Express can pull it in. But you can also use some Excel tricks. I'm sure that anybody who's done dilution series um, in Excel knows this little trick where if you know your dilution series is by twos, you can grab the cell above it, you can multiply it by two, you can drag that formula down, and then you have your titration data set in there. But what's kind of happening here is, all right, I have this spreadsheet, um, I have all these plots here, but I'm kind of running out of room on this page. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this table and I'm gonna create a new page, just like you create a new worksheet in uh, Microsoft Excel. I'm gonna paste it over here, and now I have a two-page analysis. Um, on my first page, I'll do a two-page view. My first page, I've got my uh, plots. On my second page, I have my chart or my Excel table, and that way I can work between these two interchangeably. Now, I did mention that we have things like bar plots, box and whisker plots, regression plots, all available in the software. So what will happen is if I say insert a scatter with regression plot, and I put this under my Excel chart, <clears throat> FCS Express is going to prompt me to choose some of the columns from my data. So we'll do column E, which is the concentration, versus column D, which is the ratio. And just like Excel, if I told um, you know this chart in this little sheet uh, by formatting this, I do a right click and format. If I tell it that um, the spreadsheet data has labels in the first column. You can see here that this chart just updated, right? Things update in real time when we change formatting. Um, it's gonna use that information that's there. Um, so again, what we're gonna see is like I'm gonna have concentration versus the ratio, and I can start to see some sort of curve being defined. But what we do in FCS Express is we're not super smart just about yet about how to fit this data. We just put in a, a straight up linear fit to any data that comes in by default. But again, a right click and format is the best way to change anything on any plot. And if we change this regression fit here to say Michaelis Menten, you're going to see that our R squared value is 0.94, right? A much better fit. And Michaelis Menten uh, regression fit is generally what's used for an antibody titration. Um, and you're looking at a V max, that's kind of like your plateau of where things are. But of course, with regressions, you can generally, you know, put in a few different fits to see what works best. So if I wanted to see, all right, let's look at a 5PL fit. Look, I'm getting a much, much better R squared value. I mean, 0.94 is pretty darn good, um, but any of the kind of information associated with this, I'm able to pull that in and take a look at it. Um, now again, Sean? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, this is Kathy. I just wanted to ask quickly, I think it would be beneficial. I know you mentioned we could do the stain index. Um, would you be able to, to show a more complicated formula for people like doing the stain index and um, taking into account the negative? Uh, um, 
Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can do that. Um, I'll give a quick example of kind of a more complicated formula. Um, honestly, I kind of want to move on to the amino phenotyping section. But okay. again, if you've worked with any sort of um, um, stain index in the past, or I mean, if you've worked with this in Excel, it works the same exact way, right? Um, so if we wanted to pull in, you know, we've got our, our negatives here, we've got our positives. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what the formula for the stain index is, but I know it involves the standard deviation, right? So if I needed to get another statistic in here, right? Like we'll pull in for these six data files, um, a statistic for let's say CD3 positive for the FTC parameter standard deviation, right? Then we have the standard deviation in here for the positives. Right. So if we wanted to create any sort of, you know, more complex formula and we say, you know, take the MFI of this times two times the standard deviation and then divide that by, you know, the median of this, you know, by another standard deviation, all of the same type of stuff that you would do in Microsoft Excel applies here. So really the only important thing that you need to remember is how to get the statistic that you want over here. Right, um, and I know there's two different ways of calculating a uh, stain index. You know, there, there's one based off of the standard deviation. There's one based off of percentiles. All of that kind of information is going to be available to you with a drag and drop. Um, so you can drag and drop from the data list into here. Let's see if I can get it to update across my screens here. Oops. There we go, got my multiple select. I can get something into here and whatever statistic I need for you know whatever it is I'm performing is, is actually gonna be here. Um, so standard deviations, 95th percentiles, you know, either method that you wanna use for the same index is there. Uh, we do have a whole section on our website, including a written tutorial and a five minute video tutorial about how to perform stain index. So I would recommend, you know, if you wanna go a little bit above and beyond, you know, what we're covering today, you can just search for stain index on the DeNovo software website and it will pop right up. Um, the other kind of cool thing too, um, you know, one thing I'm glad you brought up about this is that, you know, we aren't Excel, which means that we're going to have some additional statistics available that Excel won't, right? Um, things that are related to flow cytometry. And one of them in here is actually stain index. So I'm going to kind of scroll down here. And again, this is something you'll never find in Excel because apparently there aren't enough flu cytometrists in the world to be making this worth the effort for Excel. But you can enter in stain index. Um, you can look on the little variables on our website for what's actually needed here. And essentially you select, you know, positives, negatives, standard deviations, and then all that information is going to populate for you there. So does that make some sense? Or a good place to kind of get, get started with that at least? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And it's good for people to be able to, to see those tools. Just want to make sure we saw that. So that's awesome. And then just as a reminder for everyone also, as questions pop up for you, please feel free to use that chat function. Thanks, great. Sean. Yeah, no problem. And now we know that these spreadsheets are not the be all end all, right? Uh, there's a lot we can do and it links up to all the data and this is really nice. Uh, but we do know that you do want to go out to Excel sometimes, right? So there's a little button here for export and um, it just opened up on my other page. I'm going to say, put this on my desktop. I'm going to call it uh, ratio and I'm going to open this up in just a second here once it saves on the desktop and see what this looks like. So the thing you should keep in mind is that if you set up these more complex formulas, um, this isn't just some CSV file that FCS Express exports. If you have a formula reference set up in FCS Express, that will be carried over to Excel, right? So if you set up a state index and you realize, all right, well, I exported it to Excel, I got the formula wrong, well, you can change this, right? And you can change the formula any way that you want. Um, that's also going to go for things, you know, like conditional formatting, you know, sorting. If you put in conditional formatting with data bars or color scaling, things like that in your reports and your layouts, um, all that's going to be exported. And the cool thing about the conditional formatting, this kind of, I'd say it demos pretty well, right? If I move this gate around, everything in the conditional formatting, everything in the chart, 
all of that stuff updates in real time. And again, this is a final result, right? You can go back to your lab, you can look at your SAN index values, your ratio values, and start making um, some reports from them. Now, the other thing we're going to want to learn how to do in FCS Express is how to report this stuff out, right? I already showed you a kind of one-off export to Excel, but if you want to get this stuff out to something like PowerPoint or PDF or a high-resolution image, um, you go into the File tab and Export, and I'll put this again over here on my desktop. Let's see here. I'll just put it here, and I'll say Open it after saving. And what this is going to do, I choose the PowerPoint export. Everything's going to be exported to Microsoft PowerPoint that's on the two pages. And the really cool thing about using FCS Express is that when these open up in PowerPoint, it's not kind of one low resolution PowerPoint, right? It's a bunch of individual high resolution plots, right? So if I need, you know, this one, maybe 2.5 microliters um, is the particular, you know, concentration of interest, well, I can grab that plot and I can paste that into, you know, my lab notebook, my virtual lab notebook, or I can put this into my presentation for my weekly lab meeting, right? If I have my regression curve, I can move this around. I can make it as big as I want. And the other kind of nice thing is, you know, anything about these plots can be formatted directly in FCS Express. We can do that with the right click and format. You can change access labels, ticks and all that. But we know sometimes you just need to make a quick change for your lab presentation. Um, in these PowerPoint exports, you can actually ungroup them. Um, and if you ungroup these, instead of putting a little white you know, text box over an access label, you can actually change it right there, right? Maybe the, the publisher says, you know, they don't want the intermediary ticks here. They just want zero to 10, 24. Well, you can make that change on these plots. If you just need the distribution of the data to show something in a report, you can pull out the distribution of the data, right? So this doesn't mean in your PowerPoint exports, move things around your gates. That's how grants are lost and good stuff like that. But again, this is the type of stuff that you'd be needing to use tools like Photoshop and Illustrator just to get to some sort of simple lab presentation. Um, and FCS Express facilitates that by exporting the PowerPoint. But again, if you right click on a plot and you choose format, you can change anything about these plots, the axes, the scalings, um, you know, what's visible, the ranges, the titles. You can see if I check this and uncheck it, they go on and off. You can type in text. So even before you get to the export step, you can get all that stuff done um, and you end up with that final result in FCS Express, which is super, super powerful. Now, when you save this layout, you know, you need to come back and look at this another time. You go to the file tab, you go to save. Um, I'm going to put this um, here in my documents. I'm going to call it titration. And what will happen is the next time that you need to come in and do a new antibody titration, or if you need to kind of review that antibody titration, well, what you can do, you can go to open layout. If it was recent, it will be in your recent documents. Um, you can click on this and FCS Express is going to launch up and you're going to be picking up exactly where you left off. Um, so this is launching up on my other screen. Just give me a second, I'll pull this over. Looks like Zoom meetings is uh, kind of slowing down my computer performance because this should open up in about you know, 0.2 seconds on a normal day. Um, but you can see here's everything that I did. And if I have another you know, six point antibody titration, we don't need to recreate the wheel. Uh, all we need to do, remove the data files from the data list, add new ones in here, get them assigned to plots, and then we have our curves, we have our gates, everything is done, um, and it's kind of working in a template mode. Now, I do want to switch gears and just in the last, you know, 10 minutes here, talk about immunophenotyping and, and talk about a different way of doing an analysis. Um, what I want to recap from that particular example is, you know, essentially what we learned there is how to import uh, data files. We learned how to create gates. We learned how to use data specific gates. We learned how to recreate gates, how to change things in the gating hierarchy, how to use spreadsheets, how to create statistics, right? Those are a lot of basic things. It doesn't have to be an antibody titration. All of those kind of tools that we showed you are applicable to any of the types of analysis that you're doing. Uh, but again, in that particular workflow or context, it was kind of like a quick and dirty, I used to call these suck it and see experiments in the lab, right? Even an antibody titration, I grab a few tubes and I see what's going on. Um, when you're grabbing more complex experiments, say you're doing a, you know, kind of 
a big, beautiful uh, immunophenotyping experiment. Uh, I have this one up here just as an example, you know, because we're not going to build up something this complex today. But if we have a kind of bigger immunophenotyping experiment, you may have, you know, many, many pages associated with your analysis. Um, every page might have a different subset. Here we're looking at our, our T cells. Uh, here we're looking at our myeloid branch. The next thing here we're going to be looking at our uh, B cells branch, right? So all of that kind of stuff is being broken down into different pages in the analysis. Um, now to set this kind of workflow up, again, what we're going to do, again, in just about five minutes here, we're going to create this. We're going to load in some data files. In this case, we have two samples, uh, a mutant and a wild type, and three FMO controls. Now, before I get anything even into this layout, it's kind of useful to organize your data list in the, the way that you want to analyze your data. So if I know that in a report, I want to report out the wild type sample first, I then want to report out the mutant sample, and then I want to report out, say, on different pages, the FMOs, well, you can kind of move these things up and down the data list to get them into the order that you want. And once you have them ordered, you can simply drag and drop uh, from the data list, into the layout, choose to insert a plot type uh, for that particular uh, layout. All right, oh, I'm just seeing a few questions here. I just noticed the questions bar come up. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll yeah. talk about the uh, exporting in high resolution, um, deleting the names and things like that. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a few moments. Um, okay, so we've got our wild type sample in here. Uh, what we're going to do again is start creating some gates on this. Um, let me see here. And in this sample, we have a number of different parameters. Um, the way that this data was collected, uh, the folks who collect this do a live dead stain. Uh, so they're excluding, uh, only including cells that don't have 7 AD incorporated to so call them live. Again, that drag and drop. We're going to drag and drop, change to a different parameter, look at side scatter versus forward scatter, and then we'll call these cells because they're not debris. We'll drag and drop out again, right? We'll change to something like CD4. And one thing that you've probably seen, I'm kind of jumping to parameters instead of selecting them from the list. If you start typing here in the search bar, it's going to jump you to the parameter that you want to that you want to uh, get to. So again, keep that in mind when you're working with bigger data sets uh, with a lot more parameters, that little search functionality is, is pretty darn useful. And we'll create one more gate here. And the last thing we're gonna do is come over here and look at CD64 versus CD44. And on this particular plot, I'm gonna put in a quadrant. I'm just gonna stop uh, stamp it in there because I don't know where I want to set this yet. But the other thing you'll find is that if we go to the insert tab and the gate view, um, we're going to have all of our gates that we've created here set up, accessible, and kind of ready to go. So you can imagine, as I mentioned, that this stuff scales. It scales very easily. Just drag and drop, you know, to get to the different gated populations. And again, generally, if you have a gate applied to a plot, your new gate that you create on that is going to appear hierarchically. And if it doesn't, if there's some trickier things that you need to do, you can drag and drop, you can use Boolean gates. But again, these are some uh, kind of more advanced things that I think are, are best left for another um, call. Now in this workflow, you know, imagine, you know, I don't just have these four plots, but maybe I have, you know, 10 plots or 50 plots if I have more parameters. I don't want to put everything for five data files across this page. All my plots are going to end up super tiny. But instead, I want to use this next and previous button to navigate through my samples. And this is particularly useful for FMOs, right? So here's my FMO. I'll set my CD4 gate kind of based off of that FMO check it against my wild type of mutant. You know, maybe I do need to give myself a little bit more leeway here for my CD4 gate, um, but I know it's set correctly. My CD44 uh, FMO, it can come over here, kind of get that quadrant position set correctly. I can skip to my CD62, right? Go back and forth, make sure my quadrants are set correctly. And just like that, I've kind of reviewed my FMO gates and I have everything set how I want it. So what I want to do now is get information out 
for all of these data files and whatever's in this report kind of quickly and easily. Um, you may to, might also want to use text boxes in here, uh, so I can call this my report. And in this text box, you can do things like inserting little tables. Um, so if I put in a little table and I know that I want to put in, all right, maybe the percentage of CD4s, I can drag that in there, call it CD4%. Right? If I want to put in the file name, um, you can actually grab a whole plot from here, drag it in. And again, in that statistic column there, there'll be a little statistic uh, or a little area for file name, and you can get that into your report. And what will happen is as I navigate between data files, all that information updates, you know, whether it be the file name, whether it be the percent gated, it all gets updated automatically. And what we're going to final, the way that we're going to finalize this is run through what we call a batch process. And in the batch actions uh, button here, this is a place where you can tell FCS Express to export to a whole bunch of different ways at the same time. So if I wanted to print everything across all of these different data files for whatever's on the page, I can put in a print action. If I wanted to save everything to PowerPoint, well, I can go here, I can say save all of this to a PowerPoint somewhere, I'll call it here, my analysis, and I'm gonna say when I'm done exporting this, make sure I open the presentation so I don't have to go searching for it. And we can also do something like export to Excel. Um, so instead of using the integrated spreadsheet, we'll just do a direct export to Excel, right? Imagine, you know, in this case, I've only got five data files. Imagine I have 50 or 500. I wouldn't want to create a kind of integrated spreadsheet with a ton of plots and pulling all the information to it. I just want to get it directly out to Excel. Um, and you can build up that Excel report, you know, wherever you have some information, like the file name, I can drag it in here. That's going to be the first column. Percentage of cells is going to be the second column. And if I have a table, I can just drag the whole table in there and all the statistics are going to be included in that report. So I'm going to save some paper and just so you guys don't hear my printer going off next to me today, I'm going to turn off the print. And what I'm going to do is click run on the batch process. And what's going to happen is that the batch process is going to run two actions. It's going to export the PowerPoint, it's going to export to Excel, and it's going to do that across all of the iterations or all of the data files that I have in my data list very quickly, right? You can see it kind of crunched through everything. Um, Excel is opening up, PowerPoint is launching up. Um, in my Excel document, I have all the information that I asked it to export. In my PowerPoint document, I have a new PowerPoint slide for every single sample. Um, if I wanted to in this PowerPoint, I could even say, you know, on one slide, just give me this particular plot for all of my data files. We know that that's a kind of common way of exporting. But again, you know, there's a lot that we can do in the batch process. Uh, I would encourage you to check out, you know, some of our kind of short videos. Um, you'll find these in the startup screen, in the video guide. So, you know, if you do have some follow-up questions after today, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to take questions uh, through my email or by contacting us at support. But if you need a kind of quick five-minute refresher about how does batch processing work, um, you can click on this little batch processing video. You can see that's three minutes in length, and it's going to consolidate everything that I've showed you um, into a little three-minute video. Uh, we've kind of found that the attention span of scientists, if things aren't kind of exploding or it's a funny cat video, is less than five minutes. So we've done all of these short videos in less than five minutes, right? How to insert a text box, um, even, you know, how to use statistics, how to perform TISNY. Uh, spectral and mixing is in here as well. Um, all that kind of good stuff is available at your fingertips. But I do want to stop and, and take some questions because um, I do see a few things come in, uh, come through here. Um, so one of the questions was about exporting. It says, how can I export plots in a high resolution uh, in Adobe Illustrator? So FCS Express does not have an option to export directly into AI Adobe Illustrator format. However, what it does have is it has the ability, if you right click on a plot, um, you can save the selection as a picture, and you're going to be prompted to choose a meta file, bitmap, JPEGs, PNG, TIFF, um, you know, whatever type of format that you want. And the way that we control our resolution settings is through the user options. So if you click on the file tab and you click on options, 
uh, one of the first options that you're going to get is in this general category. I didn't even change anything else. You can see that we have picture output options. So if the publisher calls for a 300 DPI image, your default is going to be use the screen resolution. Change it to this and say, all right, well, my publisher wants 300 DPI, so use 300 DPI, right? Um, I think the highest we can go is 700. Uh, we definitely can't go to 7,000, but with 700, you could probably take out a billboard on, um, on the FDR with your flow cytometry plots if you want, and then Rui can look at them all day. Um, really, 700 DPI is a pretty high resolution. But if you want to force the resolution to some sort of particular number, you can do it here. And then once you apply that preference and you either export through the right click and export, um, or if you go into the file tab and do an export, the export options here will allow you to export the entire page or even that current selection as a picture. So if you needed a 700 DPI image of just what's on this page, because these were the most interesting plots for that day, um, you could do, the, do so very quickly and easily. And another question that came in is, can I delete the name of figures such as O2 CD3 plus, which has no meaning for the reporting? Um, so I'll go back and I'll, I'll open up um, that titration layout since I had saved that for, for a quick reference. Um, so I think the question there is, you know, can you um, change what's appearing, you know, I guess in, in the spreadsheets, can you change what's appearing in the plot titles, um, all that kind of good stuff. And the, and the answer is of course, yes. Um, so if I look over here, we'll do a one page view. And the one thing I didn't go into a lot today is about how to format these plots because it is, it's pretty straightforward once you understand how to access it. But if I don't want to put this file name in the title, I can right click on the plot um, or I can choose in the format tab titles, right? Kind of just like you, what you would do in a figure and other software. And right now it's showing the current file name. So if I delete that, it's gone, right? But it's also kind of cool because you can put in things like other, inf other interesting information. So if I type in current gate and I choose here from this little drop down, the current gate, it's gonna show me that no gate has been applied on this plot and the cells gate has been applied to that plot. So I often recommend to folks, you know, if you're doing kind of more advanced immunophenotyping and you're gonna have a lot of gates, to actually enable this, again, you just come into the titles, um, choose insert token, and a token is any sort of information from the layout or the plot that you can insert into the, into the page. Um, the other thing that will happen is, you know, maybe you came back later on, you said, oh, I don't wanna call this cells anymore, I wanna call this not debris right? If you change that gate name, that's going to change everywhere in the layout, including in the plot title, right? So again, those kind of information, those links are linked intrinsically and automatically throughout the layouts. Um, okay, yes, I, I guess uh, the other question that came along with that is uh, how to show the parent population name on the plot. So I think we just covered that, um, showing you which gate is applied to which plot. And Kathy had mentioned that, that these are called tokens. Um, so again, just keep this in mind, you know, uh, we could talk for a long time about tokens, but just so you get a, a better idea of what a token is, right? A token is any sort of information. Um, this is a token, anything that appears in gray, right? This statistic is a token. This gate name is a token because it appears in gray. These are things that dynamically update with your data sets. And if you right click in any text box or in a lot of places in the software, you can choose to insert different type of tokens, right? And that can even be things like the current date, the current FCS Express user, right? So if you have a template for analysis and you always want to make sure the date is stamped on there, well, put the current date token in there. If you always want to show, you know, who actually analyzed that data today, well, insert a token and put in, um, you know, the current FCS Express user, put in the current Windows user, right? Sean B, you can see I'm working off of my computer. So there's a lot of really great meta information that's coming from data files, that's coming from your computer, that's coming from your system that you can have automatically populate in FCS Express. And, you know, in a research setting, I mean, I think it's a good idea to use that. Um, but more importantly, when folks are doing clinical analysis, they're working in GLP settings, you know, they, they can't afford to have any sort of 
clerical mistakes by manually typing things in, by copying and pasting. And FCS Express really removes all of that kind of ability to um, you know, introduce errors to your analysis just by copying and pasting in a lot of different ways. So again, thanks for you know listening to me uh, kind of ramble on about flow cytometry data analysis here for uh, the last 45 minutes or an hour. Um, I really do appreciate everybody coming out to learn a little bit more about the software. Uh, again, if you're working at Sloan Kettering, um, I know if you want to get on the license there, you just need to contact Kathy and Rui, uh, Kathy or Rui, or the flow cytometry core facility. They'll be able to help you gain access to the software. If you're joining us from uh, other locations throughout the country and the world, uh, you know, you can visit the DeNovo software website, you can download a free demo, and of course these days um, most core facilities in the United States have FCS Express available. You can kind of go talk to your core facility managers and they'll be able to help you out. So with that, um, I'll, I'll open up the floor if there's any additional questions. And again, I'd like to thank Kathy and Rui for having me on here today. Uh, it was really nice speaking with everybody. We had some really great questions that came through. So um, thanks again for putting this together and, and giving us a nice uh, venue and avenue for, for getting some of this information about how to you know, work with data files in FCS Express. Thank you so much, Sean. We, we really appreciate it. And yeah, if anyone has any questions um, that, are, that are still left over, feel free to ask. Um, and I, as you have that time, I just wanted to reiterate, um, or just mention rather, because uh, I haven't iterated, <laughs> um, that we're going to uh, be attempting to do this on a weekly basis with different topics. So uh, we haven't honed in exactly the, the time for next week. Um, we're, we're hoping it's going to be the same time, but we haven't finalized that yet. Um, so it might change and we'll come out with a list of topics that we're going to be going over um, and finalize time. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and it doesn't look like there are many other questions, so I think we're okay. All right, great. So yeah, if there's any questions about FCS Express after the fact, contact myself, contact support at DeNovo Software. And um, thanks again, Kathy. Thanks again, Rory. Yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs>